For the next few weeks, the Old Testament lectionary readings follow the life of Abraham and his family. And I'll be sticking to that theme as well, since it is rich in artistic treatments, and because the gospel readings during this time focus on Jesus' teachings, which don't translate that easily into works of art. In the reading for this Sunday, we meet Abraham at age 100, and his wife, Sarah, is 90. Humanly speaking, they are well past the childbearing years and have had no children, even though 25 years before, when Abraham was 75 and Sarah 65, the Lord promised him that he would be the father of a great nation, told him to look up into the night sky and count the stars, for his descendants would be that numerous. By the time Abraham was 86 years old and Sarah was 76, in other words, after 11 years of waiting since the promise, Sarah decided that God's plan clearly wasn't working. So she persuaded Abraham to sleep with her handmaid Hagar in order to produce an heir. This 17th century painting is by the Dutch artist Matthias Tom very much under the influence of Caravaggio, with that same dramatic use of contrasting darkness and a bright light, which further accentuates the youth of Hagar and the age of Abraham and Sarah. Nobody looks thrilled with Sarah's plan, least of all Hagar, and it won't be too many more years before Sarah will regret ever having dreamed up this idea. The union of Hagar and Abraham does, indeed, produce a son, Ishmael, and we will soon be hearing more about him, both today and next week. But today's reading focuses on the arrival of three heavenly visitors in front of Abraham's tent, and most biblical scholars now describe this as an early manifestation of the Trinity. Abraham hurries to meet his guests and to offer them hospitality, but it's a bit confusing because the text clearly states that the Lord appeared to Abraham and then goes on to say that Abraham saw three men standing nearby. Abraham addresses the group by the singular salutation, my Lord, and the text continues to waver back and forth between the singular and the plural. Perhaps it is as Arendt de Gelder paints the figures in the late 17th century. One of the three appears older, larger, and seems to be the source of all the light in the painting. So presumably, he is God the Father, and he is flanked by the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then it would be logical to have Abraham defer to him as Lord, while also including the two others in all that he says. The three figures, with Abraham bowing before them and before the feast he has provided, that is all we are to focus on here. The scope is limited, and we're to focus particularly on the luminous figure of the Heavenly Father. Rembrandt employs a slightly different strategy in this etching from 1656. We have the three figures seated at the feast, with Abraham serving them in a very humble posture. And as we saw in the previous image, we have an elderly figure, we assume God the Father, seated in the middle and dominating the proceedings. But we also have Sarah peeking out from behind the door, and we have a curious little boy shooting a bow and arrow in the very center of the image. Rembrandt has condensed a great deal of storytelling into a very small etching. We know that at the time the three visitors came to Abraham, Hagar's son Ishmael was already 13 or 14 years old. We read in Genesis 16, that Ishmael was on his way to becoming, and I quote, a wild donkey of a man, constantly at odds with everyone around him. And as we will see in next week's reading, he would grow up to be an archer, very good with the bow and arrow, as we see starting here. 
We also know that Sarah would come to resent the presence of this young boy, the young boy she schemed her way into creating, because he might one day pose a threat to the inheritance of the son she was to bear the following year. So not only is Rembrandt depicting Abraham, the three visitors, and Sarah laughing in disbelief behind the door, but by including the mischievous Ishmael in the scene, he is subtly alluding to the trouble that was to come from the ill-conceived union of Hagar and Abraham. All of this Rembrandt encompassed in a print that measured roughly six and a quarter by five and a quarter inches. At the very opposite end of the spectrum in terms of density of content is the most famous depiction of the three visitors that has come down to us. Andrei Rublev's Icon of the Trinity, created around 1415. Up until the last century, the beauty of this Russian icon was largely hidden from view by a riza, the metal covering, usually of silver or gold, that was placed over an icon to protect it, with holes left to show the faces or other significant features of the icon beneath it. This is the Riza which covered the icon until early in the 20th century. And here is what the icon might have looked like when it was covered in metal. Fortunately, art lovers and scholars in the early 20th century were increasingly interested in what works of art lay below the surface of the metal covering the icons. And they were shocked to discover the beauty of Rublev's artistry once the metal was removed and the icon properly cleaned. Rublev has stripped the scene to its bare essentials, featuring the three visitors and the meal they share, with a faint allusion to Abraham's dwelling in the upper left, and the Oak of Mamre, under which Abraham had been sitting when the visitors arrived, we see it rising above the central figure, and a faintly sketched mountain in the background on the upper right, probably indicating Mount Moriah, where Abraham was directed to go when the Lord called him to sacrifice his son Isaac, which is another part of the Abraham story that we will read in two weeks' time. The three figures very beautifully form a circle with the curvature of their bodies and in their way of gazing at one another. But it is not a circle from which we have been excluded. There is a place at the table just for us. And while the three visitors dine on the calf represented in the dish on the table, we are also invited to partake of the Holy Sacrament from the chalice formed by the bodies of the figures on the right and the left. So, with an incredible economy of means, Rublev has suggested so, so much. That is why this icon is so deservedly famous and has been used by countless numbers of people as an aid in their practice of prayer and meditation. You can find many images of it online to download, or you can even uh, obtain copies of the icon, small ones, if you're interested in pursuing this particular aspect of spiritual formation and visual meditation. In the meantime, I look forward to meeting with you next week for more on the saga of Abraham and Sarah, Hagar and Ishmael.